But we come down to Pai Chang. Now, we have a, a, a practice school which has started out, uh, and there is a story about the head monk going after him, and the head monk started the gradual school, what, what we think of as the gradual school. Uh, and it died out. By the time we have the eight schools, the eight houses of Zen, the gradual school doesn't exist, so don't get it confused with anything that came later because it just died out. But it was a controversy at the time. Okay, and then it disappeared. Now, something for you to think about. And I thought of this the other day. I was watching the History Channel. But I think it's a good thing to think about. In the Orient, they assume that a, a lineage line is really, really good if it lasted until now. Because we're talking about, we're talking about historical lineage lines that are at least six, seven, eight hundred years old. Coming from one teacher. And then if we look at the, if we look at the traditional way of going all the way back to Shakyamuni. But lots of schools started that went on for a few generations. They went on as for as long as we are a country. They went on for over 200 years, maybe 300 years, 400 years and died out. And because of the perspective on time in the Orient, they're looked at as being, you know, not vital. Uh, there was something defective about them. And, of course, here, we live in this brand-new country. To, to us, that would be a very old lineage line. And, but I wonder sometimes if that is really a way of gauging whether the school was good or not, or whether it was lucky. Pai Chang wrote the rules of the monastery. Up until that time, there were, there were no rules on how a monastery should be run. Um, the Chinese were very interesting because for a couple hundred years, 300 years, they didn't even have the rules of how to be a monk. Now think about that. You get these monks that come in, they, they know most of the rules. You know that, they've got it to memory. But they didn't have a written venia, or rules of conduct. So, Buddhism comes into China, and they build monasteries. They, they print sutras. They have wonderful ceremonies and festivals. And it was a, at least, and don't, I know it was at least 300 years. It could be longer than that. Before they actually had the venia, the monk's rule. There, within the venia, there are implications on how to live in community. But in the venia, nowhere is that I know of, is there a book called How to Run a Monastery? There were, there were lots and lots of sections of books that talked about how to, how to run yourself, how to be a monk, what you could do and what you couldn't do, how um, people were to be punished, which was never corporal. We didn't practice corporal punishment. Nobody got beat because they did things bad. Uh, it was more like counseling. There were rules on, on belongings, lots of rules on what you could own, <clears throat> what you were to do if you were given too much, because nobody cares if you're given enough, but if you were given too much, how you were supposed to handle that. Of course, these were all very practical practice rules so that you wouldn't become attached to fancy robes or having lots of, of stuff. But there really was no rule on how to run a monastery. But the Chinese, the way their mind works, they worry about those kind of things. So they developed on their own some, some basic rules on how they did things. When we come to Pai Chang, this is the guy that wrote the set of rules on how to run a monastery. And everybody uses them. Okay? Everybody uses his rules that runs a monastery that we think of as Zen. And for that matter, anybody that's Chinese, all the Chinese monasteries use Pai Chang's rules. All the Japanese monasteries use Pai Chang's rules. Now, you want the paradox? There's not one single existent copy of Pai Chang's rules. So what we have, you know, the Jews talk about. They have the Torah, and they have the living Torah, which is tradition. And so what we have are traditions within temples. But the actual rule has been lost. Okay? But Pai Chang brought the work ethic into Zen. 
Pai Chang uh, was out one day raking the leaves. That was his job. He was easily in his 80s. He was the abbot and the master of the temple. His younger disciples were on the roof taking care of the sh- you know clay shingles. People were working in the garden. Well, he got up one day and went to get his rake because he always raked the Samaria, clearing the pathways. Couldn't find it. His closest disciples had decided the master was too old and too venerable to be out there doing the scut work. So he looked and he looked and he looked and he couldn't find his rake and he went back to his room and he stayed there the rest of the day. And when the, the lunch bell rang, he didn't go. And when the dinner bell rang, he didn't go. And the next day he got up and he looked for his rake and he couldn't find his rake. And so he went back to his room. This went on for a number of days. And finally, his innermost disciples went to him and said, Master, are you okay? Are you sick? He said, no, I'm fine. He said, but you haven't been to eat for so many days. And he said, I can't find my rake. And I said, well, what's that got to do with it? He said, well, everybody in this temple works. And if I don't work, I don't eat. So a day without work is a day without eating. And this is one of the oldest Zen sayings in existence. The only excuse for not working is illness. And people that are ill are treated special. Most big temples have an infirmary, and they're taken to the infirmary. And one monk's job, or nuns, is to make sure they're taken care of. That they don't get too cold, they don't get too hot. They're even allowed to eat meat in the infirmary. Because there was a conception that sometimes that little bit of extra protein would help them out. But Pai Chang gave us not only an ordered system for the monasteries, on the various duties of the people within the monasteries and who took care of what and how things were to be done. But he also gave us this ethic of working. And he did it in the only valid way. That's the way he lived his life. He got up every day. Now, he couldn't do the heavy work anymore, so he did the light work. But he continued every day to set the example. My teacher was very much the same. Some of the most often repeated stories about him are him jumping up and down in a dumpster. (laughs) And I really think that since they don't have carnival rides in Vietnam, this was his, this was his, uh, you know, Disneyland. Because a typical day on Saturdays at, at, uh, at my master's temple, the mornings were always filled with work because people work there. You know, they, they come home and it's dark. But Saturday morning was Samu. Saturday morning, there would be a meeting and everybody would be assigned things to do. And he would be right there with him. Okay, it was none of this going back to the office because I'm the patriarch, and and by that time he was officially had the title of patriarch. So he'd be out there jumping up and down in the dumpster because they had two dumpsters, and there was never enough space in there to put all these garden cuttings. So he had to scrunch it down, and he'd invite people to get up there with him. Okay, so. That that ethic still lives. 